Open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm so thankful for the words of that song we just sang, for the thoughts and the concepts there. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. I don't have to... I, I try to please God, but I can't please God on my own. Uh, and I don't have to wear the burden of the law, of the standards of holiness that I fall short of every hour of every day. I don't have to wear that guilt uh, around my neck as a weight because of the work of Christ. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Praise God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 12. We'll read through the end of the chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 12. It says, Therefore our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshy wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly toward you. For we are not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand. Now I trust you will understand even to the end. As also you have understood us in part, that we are your boast, as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. And in this confidence I intended to come to you before, that you might have a second benefit to pass by way of you to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you, and be helped by you on my way to Judea. Verse 17. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I, not, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh, that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no? But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no, was not duplicitous. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Sylvanius and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him amen, to the glory of God through us. Now He who establishes us with you in Christ, and has anointed us in God, who has also sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee, moreover I call God as witness against my soul, that to spare you I came no more to Corinth, not that... We have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. Let's pray. Lord, remind us again of the truth of your word, of who you are. Remind us of how you made us and designed us to walk with Christ, to know you more rightly, to trust in you more strongly. I pray, God, you do your work in our hearts. Take your word, Lord, again, we ask. Plant it deep in us. Do your work. We are your people. It is your word. It is for your glory, not ours. I pray, God, that you'd be blessed and glorified because of the uh, attention and the focus that each individual heart would give your word today and uh, consider for ourselves. In your son's name, amen. Well, we are in a study on 2 Corinthians. We started it uh, a few weeks ago. And it's a joy for me to go through 2 Corinthians. I really enjoy this book. There's a lot to be learned. Uh, I shared with you uh, a few weeks ago that there are several reasons that Paul writes the book of 2 Corinthians. One of those reasons are because Paul was being accused of all sorts of wickedness with his interactions with the Corinthians and the church there in Corinth. He had all these accusations against them, and he was answering, in part, those accusations. Several passages of 2 Corinthians are in his defense as an apostle and, and how, he, uh, how he ministered among them with godly deportment. He he, he wasn't duplicitous. There was all sorts of accusations against Paul. Uh, people accused him of, of being uh, a, a false teacher, of wanting to have his way 
uh, with the church of, uh, of even, they even scholars say that they accused him of focusing on the church in Corinth so much because Corinth was known as a sinful city. It had a wicked reputation and they accused Paul of embracing that and, and having his way with women in the church. There was all sorts of accusations against Paul. And one of the reasons that he writes 2 Corinthians is to address those accusations. And in this passage of Scripture, he defends himself. Uh, he, He defends himself. He appeals to the way he interacted with them when he was in their presence. Uh, before that, in the, the beginning 11 verses of chapter 1, he, he appeals to their relationship. He talks about the suffering that he went through and how that suffering is in part for their benefit, that he is suffering for them. The sufferings are working consolation in their church, in their body. So he's appealing to the relationship he has with the Corinthians. He's appealing to the fact that he's suffering in part for them. His suffering is good for the church in general. Because if he wasn't true, if he wasn't truly uh, serving the Lord, he would not suffer for them. And so he appeals to them. He appeals to their relationship. And in chapter 12 through, or verse 12, excuse me, to the end of chapter 1, he appeals to his conscience, his conduct among them, and how he has a clean conscience in their presence. And you see verse 12 of chapter 1. It says, For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity. He is appealing to the fact that he has a clean conscience before God in his deportment with the church in Corinth. You see that word conscience. Underline that word conscience in your Bible. Or at least let it stick out to you in your mind. That is what this passage is about. Paul's conscience is clean before God. That word for boast there in verse 12, for our boasting is this, our conscience is clean. The word boast isn't a sinful boast. Sometimes when you think of the word boast or bragging, it has to do with a a sinfulness uh, or at least a selfishness. We, We boast about ourselves. We boast about how much money we have or all the nice things that we have or the, our achievements in life or the degrees on our wall or, or the, where our kids are in life. You know, you know what boasting is. Boasting can be sinful. It can be selfish. This boasting is not. That word boast simply means proud confidence. What Paul is saying is I have a proud confidence in the, the, the conscience that I had that I was godly among the Corinthians. And what he's doing is he's pointing to his reputation He's pointing to his conscience. He's pointing to uh, the way he walked with them, how it was done well in simplicity and godly sincerity. Not with fleshy wisdom. Not, not with guilt and making demands and, and forcing people to do his will. But in grace, by the grace of God that worked more abundantly toward you, he says in verse 12. He's appealing to his conscience. In 1984, there was a plane crash that, uh, that, that took place in Spain. And it was a Spanish crew that was piloting an Avianca Airlines jet full of people. And after the plane crashed and everybody died, there were the investigators looking into it found the black box. The black box records everything that takes place in the cockpit. And they listened to the recording and they made an eerie discovery. And that was moments before the plane crash, this Spanish crew heard a voice over their comms in English saying, pull up, pull up. And one of the pilots replied, shut up, gringo, and flipped off that switch, flipped off that voice. Moments later, the plane crashed into a mountain and everybody died. And sometimes we can treat our consciences like that. Our conscience will be screaming at us, pull up, pull up, and we reply with, shut up, gringo. Just quiet that voice. And a lot of people live their whole life like that. They they, they know they're making some compromises. They know 
that what they're doing is sinful, that it goes against God's plan. And in that moment of compromise, their conscience screams at them, stop it, don't do that, don't listen to Him, don't go in that direction, don't look at that, don't go in there, don't sign that paper, don't steal that, whatever it might be, and our reaction is just shut up. And we quiet that voice. God designed the conscience of man into the very framework of the human soul. We are fearfully and wonderfully made by God. Our conscience is a part of God's design. Your conscience is the voice inside of you that has a sense of rightness or wrongness. And when you're committing some sort of wrongness, is telling you to not do that. And we can tell it to be quiet or we can listen to that voice. In Romans 2, 14 and 15 up on the screen, Paul reminds us that the conscience is a part of the human makeup. It says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. Even Gentiles who do not know God, Paul is saying, have a conscience that is uh, somewhat consistent with the law, the Ten Commandments, don't steal, don't murder, don't kill, don't commit adultery. And their conscience can either accuse them, you messed up, you have some guilt, or their conscience can excuse them, saying, it's okay, everybody does it, we justify sin in all sorts of ways, our conscience excusing our behavior. How your conscience works is you choose in your heart a standard of living, and when you violate that standard, your conscience starts screaming at you, pull up, pull up, stop doing that, stop looking at that. Don't go in that direction. And then you violate your conscience when you violate that standard that you have set for yourself. When my children were little uh, in our previous home in eastern Iowa, there was a time where they, we, we, we discovered a broken plate. And uh, it had been cleaned up, but not cleaned up very well. And uh, Jill asked me if I broke the plate. I said, no. And so that only leaves three suspects at the time. It was three suspects. So we called the children together. We talked to them about the broken plate. Somebody broke a plate, didn't say anything, tried to clean it up, but did a bad job. And uh, we need to know who did it. And crickets, just silence. Nobody fessed up to it. Did you do it? No. Did you do it? No. Did you do it? No. And then... We just assumed that the plate grew legs, hopped out of the cupboard, broke on the floor, and uh, it just broke itself, right? So we went about our, our day, and then, uh, but, but now we have a bigger problem, because the problem isn't just the plate, the problem is somebody's lying, and lying is always way worse than the original transgression, right? Hopefully that's how you, you think in your household if if somebody lies about doing something, the, the punishment is way worse because lying is worse than breaking a plate in this case. And then an hour later, my soft conscience daughter, Katie, goes up to mom and says, it was me, I did it, I broke the plate. Her conscience got the better of her. She was tearfully confessing to a transgression. And what had happened in her mind was she had a standard for her conscience, and that standard was her, her parents' desires for her. Her, her. What her parents wanted for her, the way her parents have taught her, maybe she didn't want to violate the relationship, and so that would weigh heavy on her conscience as well. And, but she set a standard for herself, and when she violated that standard, the, the voice in her head, the sense of rightness and wrongness, got the best of her, and she confessed. Most people think of their conscience uh, in terms of 
what everybody else does. They, they set a standard for themselves of, uh, of rightness and wrongness based upon what everybody else is doing. <clears throat> when I was a youth pastor in Ames, I counseled a, a teenager that had uh, become addicted to pornography. Uh, he'd struggled with this for months or years. And uh, in counseling with him, I, I, I asked him how this began, what were the thoughts that started this and he said that he was he was told though he was a church guy raised in church he was told that it was normal for kids his age to view pornography and that set him down a road of addiction and what he did in that in that instance is he changed the standard from a higher standard that that that's wrong uh, you know the standard of his church the standard of his parents his his, his conscience has chose a standard in his heart. And then he lowered that standard to what everybody else does. The peer group. What people my age do. If everybody my age is doing it, then it's okay. And, and he lowered that standard. You know what that's like. I know what that's like. To lower the standard of our conscience and say, as long as, as I'm not worse than my peer group, worse than people around me, then it's okay. <clears throat> Car salesmen do this. They can... I used to be a car salesman, and, and I, I, I saw this firsthand. And they can sell lemons of a vehicle to, to poor people and to families and not feel bad because that's what their entire peer group is doing. That's what that whole industry does. And as long as that's what everybody does, then they can feel okay about it. So somewhere along the line, you pick a standard for yourself of rightness and wrongness. How right are you going to be? Where are you going to allow yourself to make some compromises? When is your conscience going to get the best of you? What morality do you adhere to? And then you obey that or you violate that and your conscience screams at you. Uh, politicians of old used to have a high standard for themselves. There was a famous story of George Washington cutting down his father's cherry tree. And when his father confronted him, he replied with, I cannot tell a lie. It was I who cut down the cherry tree. Right? And that story is supposed to make his constituents at the time trust him more. And if that's your standard, where your conscience adheres to, that's wonderful. Politicians today don't quite maintain that same standard, do they? But what happens is we have a conscience that adheres to a standard certain standard, a sense of right and wrong based upon the choosing of your heart. Hopefully, it is closer to Scripture. And when you violate that standard, your conscience screams at you, and you can choose to listen to it, or you can choose to ignore it. But the question today is what does God want your conscience to hold to as its standard? Where do you go to understand what's right and wrong? Hopefully, it's the Word of God, right? Hopefully, we let God tell us what's right and wrong and what we hold on to. Look at verse 12 again of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. For our boasting is this. My, he says, our proud confidence is this. The testimony of our conscience. How we conducted ourselves in the world, in our ministries, in simplicity and godly sincerity. Can you say the same thing? That you are proudly confident in your conscience of how you conduct yourself in the world. Godly sincerity. Simplicity. Not with fleshy wisdom, but by the grace of God. Look at verse 23 of chapter 1. Towards the end here. Paul again has gone through several verses here of defending himself. He's not duplicitous. He's not saying yes and no at the same time. He's not, he's not being insincere. Some people accused him of saying one thing to, to one person, another thing to another person, being deceitful. And in verse 23, he says, Moreover, I call God as a witness against my soul that to spare you I came no more to Corinth. In other words, his reason for not going to Corinth was valid. He told them he would go, but 
but he couldn't go, and God knows that his conscience is clean in that matter. But look what he says. Moreover, I call God as witness against my soul. Can you do that? Can you stand before God and say, God, look at my heart. Look at my soul. Look at my motives. Look at my life. I am trying my best. Can you say that before God? Paul is giving us an example of a high standard of conscience. I call God to be a witness against my soul. I stand before God and say, God, is there any wicked way in me? And I know the answer is no, Paul, Paul is saying. We sometimes, if we are to be that open to the presence of God, where we say, God, bear witness against my heart, is there any wayward way that our mind instantly goes to something we know we shouldn't be doing? It instantly goes to an area of our life that needs improvement. An area of life that we've kept hidden from God. God is calling us to a high standard. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. This is the part of the Sermon on the Mount passage. And it's one of, if you're not familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, you really should be so. It's, it's, 101 Christianity. It's how Jesus taught the first disciples. It's really an important section of Scripture to be well versed in. The whole Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5 through 7, but I want to focus on Matthew 5 48. Here Jesus tells us a standard of living before God. Matthew 5 48 says, Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Matthew 5.48. What's the standard there? Perfection. Kind of creates a dilemma. How do we attain perfection? The overall teaching here is to raise the standard of your righteousness, of your love, of your service to God and to people. Verse 43 through 48, the, the broader context of, of verse 48 is a discussion uh, about their standard of living. Jesus says in Matthew 5.43, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you, and persecute you. What he's saying is, you know the, the current standard is Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And this is what ancient Jews did. And they, they, pri they would pride themselves on this. They would love their neighbor, their fellow Jew, their fellow is uh, Hebrew person, their neighbor, geographically, and hate their enemy. They would, they would hate the Gentiles. They would hate the Samaritans. They would hate those that are occupying Israel, the, the Roman Empire. They would hate those specifically on purpose that were against the Hebrew way of life. And it was a way of being righteous. The, the ancient Jews thought if they hated their enemies, that they were being right with God. It was a good thing to hate their enemies. And uh, Jews, even today sometimes, if they're orthodox, think that it is a good thing to hate those that stand very opposed to the nation of Israel. Sort of some Muslim uh, or uh, Palestinian conflicts there. They consider it a righteous, noble thing to hate their enemy. Jesus says that is the standard that you know in verse 43. This is a standard you're familiar with. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Jesus says, Jesus is giving us a better, higher, more loving, more godly standard. But I say to you, love your enemies. Love the Roman people. Love the tax collectors. Love the Gentiles. Love the Samaritans. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. You go out of your way to provide for those that hate you. Turn the other cheek, that idea. Do good to those that hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, verse 45. 
For He makes His sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So He says, Your Father in Heaven blesses those that are unjust, blesses those that deny God, that deny Christ. With rain, with sunshine, there's a general goodness to them. He doesn't purposely hate uh, or treat with hatred uh, in His behavior towards them on earth if they're evil, if they stand against God. But He blesses them. He makes the sun shine on them. He sends rain on them. Verse 46, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Are not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? So what he's saying is purposely in your heart, raise the standard of your conscience, of your love, of your service to God and service to others. Intentionally raise the bar from hating your enemies as a good thing to loving your enemies as a good thing. And what he teaches us here is to be like the Father. Verse 48, Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So where should our standard for our conscience be set? Christ's likeness is the goal. Be like Christ. Be like God. All you need to know to how to treat anybody you have in your history with God. Look at your testimony. How, how God was gentle with you. How God was kind to you. How God was loving to you. How God pursued you. How God was patient when you struggled with sin over and over for months or years. That same sin, being unfaithful to God. How patient God is to you. Be that patient. Be that loving. Be that, that kind. Treat people the way God treats you. Raise the bar. Don't look at tax collectors and say, you know, they're the worst of the worst, but even they can do nice things. Raise the bar to verse 48. Christ likeness, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. The dilemma becomes if we are to choose then a standard based upon the Word, based upon what Jesus says the standard should be, which is perfection, we know we can't attain that standard. So what do we do? We don't compromise. We don't say, well, as long as I'm a better Christian than other people around me, as long as I'm better than everybody else in my peer group, as long as I'm a better Christian than other people in my high school or other people in my work or other people in my church, then I'm okay. We set the bar at perfection and say, I'm going to improve, I'm going to grow, I'm going to submit, I'm going to obey. Whatever God brings my attention to an area that needs improvement, I will submit, I will improve. Improve, grow in Christ-likeness until the day God calls us home. When God points out sin to you in the area of your life that is outside of His will, repent and start over. If you fail, when you fail, repent and start over. Don't give up on living the life that Christ wants for you. In Christianity, we never get to a place where we feel like we have arrived. Uh, there, there's many religions that, that teach if you live a certain way long enough, if you think a certain way long enough, you'll become enlightened, you'll find nirvana, you'll have arrived, and then you can rest on this new plane of righteousness. Uh, the Bible doesn't have that in store for us. God's plan is, is that we always improve. We always submit more and more of our life over to Him. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. Proverbs, six says. Proverbs 3, 6 says. Maybe you feel like you've given up a little bit on the life that Christ has for you. Maybe you feel like you know well the standard that God has, but it's hard and over time, you've said to yourself, I know I need to be doing more for the Lord. I know I need to be sharing the Gospel. I know I need to be spending quality time in prayer. I know I need to be going deeper into His Word. I know I need to serve the Lord in my church or in my neighborhood with my neighbor. I know I need to be a Proverbs 31 woman who works hard for the family. 
I know I need to lead my house in a more godly manner. I know I need to grow in my understanding of the Bible. I know I've neglected that for a long time. I know I need to address broken relationships in my life, but it's so hard, it's so overwhelming, I don't know where to start. It's easier just to change the standard. It's easier just to lower the bar and tell that voice in my head, shut up, gringo. It's easier to check out and stay numb. It's easier to sear my conscience. Can you relate to that idea? What do you do if that's you? What do you do if you have lowered the bar and and God is drawing your attention to that? I want you to look at Matthew 5.48 again. It says there, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. The beauty of this verse is that in Christ, you and I have been made perfect. Isn't that something? Isn't that a source of joy? In Christ, we have been made perfect. God sees us. He sees the righteousness of Christ, which is itself perfect. He doesn't see your failings and everything you're doing wrong and hold it against you. He sees where, where you have gone wrong and is, is encouraging you to, to improve and grow in that area. But He doesn't hold it against you because we've been made perfect in Christ. So therefore, we point ourselves to the Gospel, be reminded that there is no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. Say hallelujah and start again. Start afresh. Put one foot in front of the other and obey starting right now. You get alone with God and you pour your heart out to Him and you tell Him that you realize your error, you've made a mistake, you've seen where you've lowered that bar where you've said as long as I'm, as long as I'm here then I'm okay, I can live with my compromise, I can live with my sin as long as I don't get any worse. And that was wrong. And you get alone with God and you tell Him that and you repent. That means you turn it around and you just start living for the Lord, claiming the perfection that Christ has made for you. Claiming that righteousness. God knew what He was doing in giving us this standard of perfection, of Christ-likeness. Saying, get after being obedient like Christ. God knows it's going to be challenging, and God knows that we are prone to compromise. But if we are willing to turn to the Lord, 1 John 1 reminds us of this beautiful truth. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So maybe there's areas of your life where you've compromised and you said, I've changed my standard. I, I know God wants more for me, but I'm okay with, with, with less. Confess that to God. And you know what He's going to do? He's going to forgive. He's going to cleanse. If we confess our sins, He's faithful. We just sang about that. He is just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God. Turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Where would we be if not for the Gospel? The Gospel gives us our hope, gives us our direction. And so claim the work of the Gospel where your conscience has been seared. Talk to God about that. Open yourself back up to the presence of God and and say, God, wherever You point out, I will obey. If i got to give up sin, I'll give up sin. It will be hard, but God, You will help me. If I have to start a ministry, if I have to start doing something, uh, I'll do it. It will be hard, but God, You will help me. And take one foot in front of the other doing what's right every step of the way. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 12, For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshy wisdom, but by the grace of God. That phrase there, fleshy wisdom, stands out to me. 
when people compromise their standards and, and they know they have compromise in their hearts, they have sin in their heart, and they, they're holding on to their sin. They, they have to hide behind fleshy wisdom in order to feel good in front of other believers. I've seen this many times with pastors that have walked away from the faith. Uh, I, I knew a pastor once that was a pastor in his church for, I think, about 12 years, did a great job, had a good reputation. But the last year of his ministry, he was having an affair, and it came out, he left the church, it, it broke the church's heart, as you can imagine. He, he, he ran away with this woman that wasn't his wife, left his wife behind in the church, and the church uh, ministered to her. But they agreed that during the last year when this affair was going on, uh, his messages, this pastor's messages, were all performance and production. He put on a show. He, he, his, instead of having godly uh, sermons, they were more masterful oratory rhetoric. And he was just hiding behind a good performance. And Christians are like that. When we knowingly have compromise, we try to cover it up with fleshy wisdom. We find one thing that we do well or looks good to a crowd or looks good to men, and we hide behind that. We can say, I'm an intellectual or I'm wonderful at uh, apologetics or I'm good with finances or I'm a good Sunday school teacher or I'm a deacon or I'm a writer. We, we find something that looks good. We hide behind that until we feel better about ourselves. One more common example of this is Ravi Zacharias. I don't know if you know who Ravi Zacharias is, but he was a famous writer and speaker, wonderful writer, wonderful speaker. But he was a, a premier apologeticist. He argued for the Bible, argue, argued for uh, creation. He was uh, brilliant at Christian philosophy. Uh, he died recently, or a couple years ago, and after his death, it was found out that he was having all these affairs that were taking place. He had seared his conscience, but he was hiding behind his wonderful ability to write and to think and to be a philosopher. And, and that's, how, that's how our conscience works. When we know it's seared, we hide behind something we do fairly well. Paul says, I didn't conduct myself in fleshy wisdom. But by the grace of God I conducted myself and more abundantly toward you. I want you to consider that there might be an area of your life that you have compromised. That you have lowered the bar. That you've said, I know here's what I should be doing, but, but I, I've chosen this standard instead and I can live with myself at least for a while. I want you to consider that God's plan for you is to be sorrowful in your sin. To, turn, to use that, that sorrow to turn back to God that produce real righteousness. It might be hard work. It might, be, it might take some perseverance. It might take some spiritual sweat. But give God the glory due His name. Give the Lamb that was slain the reward for His suffering, which is our obedience. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul writes this. He says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, he was talking about a letter that he wrote that he reprimanded the church. They were sorrowful. He says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. That is not a bad thing if your sorrow leads to repentance. It's not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What, what good works it produced in you, he says. That word diligence, it means you've worked hard. You've worked hard because of the, your re, heart's reaction to your sorrow that God pointed out. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. Your life changed. Your heart has changed because of that repentance. What indignation. Now you hate that which God also hates, which is sin. What fear. 
of God. What vehement desire. Oh, I want to please God. Live for Him. That's how we should think. What vehement desire for holiness and living the godly life. What zeal we have for God and for His church. What vindication. God has given us the victory in Christ. In all things, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. This is how Paul is going to teach the church to handle their, their sorrow. When God points out sin in our lives, we go to God, we say, I see the merit, I see what you're doing, uh, I, I see what I've gone wrong, and I thank you for pointing it out to me, and I'm going to get after being obedient. Not because we're trying to earn anything or earn salvation, but because God has given us the victory and we're thankful for what He's done. I remember there was a time when I was a youth pastor. I had, I had some secret sin in my life, some hidden sin, and, and I had a, a proudful attitude. Uh, I, was, I was a youth pastor for five years, and this was towards uh, year three or four. It was a real turning point in my life where I was a, a pastoring, I was in the ministry, I was a young man in my uh, 20s, and I, uh, it was a turning point where I realized that my standard I had lowered for myself, and God pointed it out to me. What had happened was, there was a, a gift that was given to me, and uh, somebody said that they had something for me, I was all on cloud nine that I had this gift that was given to me. And uh, I skipped evening service to, to go to his house and get it. And uh, as, as a staff member of the church in Ames, you're not allowed to skip services. As you imagine, you need to be there. And, uh, and, but I could get away with it because of my pride and my ego. And, and, uh, and, and so I skipped church and, and I went and I... I had that moment of patting myself on the back and feeling good about myself, getting this gift. And I go back to church, and I, I had gotten away with it. Nobody noticed. And then in, uh, I, I talked to the pastor after the service wrapped up, and everything was fine. Um, the next week, we had a staff meeting, and something had happened in that church service that I had missed. There was a couple that uh, was was in sin and they came in front of the church and apologized and were restored back to the church and so so he he said I want to talk about what what happened with that couple and he said first of all everybody was there right you all saw what happened and he looked at me looked at everybody Matt you saw what happened no I didn't I lied I had it I had this ego I had this pride attitude and then we, he went on, and well, I, I didn't say that, but I said that to myself. And uh, we went on to finish the staff meeting. The next day, he invited me out to lunch, bought me this nice, fancy meal at this fancy restaurant. First of all, I think he just liked eating fancy food. But he, he bought me this nice meal, and he said, I want to talk to you about why you skipped church on Sunday. And it made me realize that I had, the reason I did that was because of my pride. I had lowered the standard for myself. I said, as long as I can get away with it, it's okay. I had hidden sin that wasn't being dealt with that played into that decision. And here was the, the pastor being led by God, loving me with this nice meal. And it was like God was just revealing all this stuff to my own heart. And I saw my error. I saw my sin. I saw my compromised standard. I, uh, I saw that there was love being given to me. He wasn't mad at me. He just wanted to talk about it. And I, the, the dam just burst, and I just wept. I realized that this was God getting a hold of my attention, of my sin. And God is a good God who loves us with a perfect love and won't let us get away with sin because He loves us. And that's a beautiful thing. And, and I, I apologized. I repented. I turned it around. And I'm telling you, the, the best place you can be is broken in the hand of God, knowing that He loves you, He cares for you, He brings attention to sin in our hearts so that you can glorify Him uh, in a more sincere, godly way. He just wants what's best for us, and what's best for us is to follow His will. We serve a good God. 
So where you have compromise, get after turning that around. Have that godly sorrow that leads to clearing of yourself, indignation, fear, vehement desire, zeal, and vindication. Knowing that we have the victory in Christ. Jesus loves you with a perfect love. You are His son or daughter. He just wants what's best for you. And isn't that wonderful? That is good news. You should sing hallelujah. Praise be to God. Let's close in a word of prayer and ask for God's blessing on this message on our hearts. If you have an area that you've compromised, that God is pointing out to you, get after being obedient. The best, the best thing you can do is to trust and obey, to find peace, joy with God, loving the wonderful work of the Father. Let's pray. Lord, it is with joy that we sing Your praises. To to focus on the righteousness of Christ that is our righteousness because of the cross. To focus on the love that You have for us knowing that we have sin and compromise and yet You love us worse than all. You love little old us with a passionate perfect love and You've given us righteousness. Lord, there's areas that we have compromised. There's areas that we have turned from Your standard. There's areas that we have said, oh, I can get away with this sin. Lord, give us tender hearts this morning. Convict us. Challenge us. Don't let us stay comfortable in our compromise but pursue us with Your holy pursuit of conviction and encouragement. I pray, God, that uh, You would help us to know deep within our hearts that we are forgiven, that we are loved, and that all we have to do is turn it over and it will lead to some wonderful vindication, zeal, godliness, God, I pray that You'd give us the braveness and boldness to live for You fully and brightly this week. Thank You for Your grace. Thank You for Your love. In Your Son's name, Amen. We're going to sing one verse of Yet Not...